Good morning, good morning. My name is Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here along with Pastor Kaz and Shino is out doing some ministry today. There's stuff happening in the church, there's stuff happening outside of the church, so I'm blessed to be one of the three pastors here uh, in, this, in this church body. And I've got a word from the scripture. I love going to the, the Bible and pulling out, God, what are you saying? What's relevant to our lives? How are you going to shift and mold and change our heart to agree with your divine plan and order for our lives in this wild city. And during worship, actually, I've got a question that's just on my, on my heart as well. Why, why is life, why is life just hard? <laughs> is it just me or is it, like, why is life so dang hard? Uh, yesterday, it was a beautiful day. Oh my gosh, fall day, blue skies, orange leaves. I thought, let's get the family out, let's go for a walk. And I had a child that made it there aim to make sure we did not go on that walk. And only by the grace of Jesus and the love of my wife did I make it through this moment <laughs> where my desire to get out and breathe some fresh air with my family, who I love, and I'm just trying to lead them into good things, just trying to do good stuff. I made a big brunch for them, and then I'm like, surely we can all graciously just leave the house together. And it was like, no, we will not graciously do anything. Like, why is life so hard? <laughs> love on a parent today. Just, just love on a parent. Moms, you're heroes. You're absolute heroes. The culture, the, the, your family, just nobody can possibly appreciate a mom enough. I mean, we're all here because of a mama somewhere. It's not Mother's Day, but it darn well should be every day. Uh, so love on, love on a mother. Life's tough. And during worship, I was reminded of an image that's in our city and it's Atlas at Rockefeller Center. He's there, arms back, holding the weight of the world on his back. And I believe that that's an image of how we are asked to work in this city, to keep our rent up, to do the impossible for, the, for our employer, to perform for our family, to keep up with the Joneses and the Smiths and everybody else next door. We are asked in this city to never sleep and to go with all our might and to carry the weight of the world and to do it happily and to do it with, with your blog saying everything is great and my life is better than everybody else and being in the city is better than anything else. And that's the way that we're asked to perform in this city with every muscle and fiber of our being holding up the weight of the world moment by moment. But across the street from Atlas, in the back of St. Paul's Cathedral, is a forgotten statue of a three-year-old baby Jesus who's holding out the world in front of him like it's a beach ball. And I believe that that Jesus is inviting us to carry the weight of our lives and the difficulties that we face day by day, the impossible tasks in our work and the impossible situations in our home with a different grace. And if we can invite that Jesus into our lives, if we can learn his ways, if we can follow his path, then I believe he's going to offer us a new strength that's not just to strengthen our muscles, but a divine power and grace to carry that load in a new way to get it off of our back and onto his hands. So Jesus, would you please answer us today to learn the practice of peace, to learn the ways that you're teaching us to walk. God, would you please carry our burdens in a fresh way and give us the wisdom, strength, insight, understanding of who you are and what you're asking us to. Lord, forgive us for where we've pushed you off. We invite you into our lives in a fresh way this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been walking through a series called Sol Solace, finding peace in our hearts and in our souls and the mind. And it comes to us from Philippians chapter four, verse four through nine. I believe that there's a power in the word of God. So church, can we stand up together and get this word flowing through us together? And we're gonna read Philippians chapter four, four through nine, all together, it's gonna be on the screen. So let's read together, Philippians four. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Next slide.
Thank you. You may be seated. Paul clearly had some rhythms and patterns and practices in his life that were visible and evident. He said, whatever you've learned or received or heard and seen in me, practice these things, practice these things. And this is what we want to talk about today. What are we practicing? What are you practicing? So rather than just examining Paul, I want to put the question to us, what is your practice? And we're going to look at the reason for our practice, the nature of practices and the outcomes of our practice. Starting with the reason of practice. Why do we practice? What are the things that we practice? Well, you are currently eating the fruit of the seeds that you planted six months ago. Whatever you have been practicing, you are currently in the reality of your practices. Some say practice makes perfect. Whatever we, whatever we practice, we will perfect. That rhythm turns into a pattern, turns into a routine, turns into either a rut or a groove for our life. What we practice turns into the life that we lead and the life that we live. Your life is perfectly designed to achieve the results that you're getting right now. This is the reality of our practice. Self-help guru and author of Atomic Habits, a phenomenal book, James Clear says this, every action that you take is a vote for the type of person that you wish to become. No single instance will transform your beliefs, but the vote will build up. So does the evidence of your new identity. Every do, everything that you do is a vote for the person that you will become. And this is the reality of the situation. It's kind of the science, the math of the situation, but it's also the atlas of the situation. This is, not, this is what self-help gurus will say. This is what our city tells us. This is what the, every, every well-chiseled muscle of atlas in in Rockefeller Center says of us, what are you practicing? Who's the person that you're becoming? Are you living the better you today than you were yesterday? But I believe that Jesus wants to give us something a little bit different than just what self-help will say. We can see that practices are important. But are we achieving yet what Jesus promised to us? He said, I've come that you might have life and life to the full. Is that what we've got yet? Jesus, we want something more than just what self-help can bring us. We want something more than just exercise and routine and meditation can bring us. We want something more than what our own abilities can get. Are you satisfied yet? I'm personally not. I want more of something else. More peace, more happiness, more joy, more solace in the situation. Not just that my external situations would change, but I would be a, a fount of peace for my family a source of security for my church and my community, that something flowing out of me would be different than what's in the city. And so just self-help will not get us there because self-help has gotten New York to where it is today. It's perfectly designed for the results that it's getting. Burnt out, more self-medication, more depression, more suicide, more crime than ever before. And this is the water that we swim in. If statistics have anything to say with where we are today, one in four of us are depressed. And I don't want to heap any condemnation on you. I don't believe that that is your fault or your doing, but I do believe that there's something that we can do to help. If we can invite the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who holds the whole world in his hands in that image of the three-year-old boy holding out the world like a beach ball. If we can invite him in, I believe something will be different. So what is the nature of practice? The nature of practice is that it's goal-orientated. We normally have a picture of what we want to achieve, and we start putting into practice those things. We read the biographies of our heroes, whether it's Barack Obama or Steve Jobs or General Patton, whoever it is, we set our eyes on. If they wake up at four, we wake up at four. If they skip breakfast, we throw out the bananas. Whatever it is, we start to emulate those things, and often we read our Bible as though it's something other than a biography. Have you noticed that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are biographies? I believe that they're offering to us a pattern, a lifestyle, a way of Jesus. In the beginning, we weren't called Christians. We were called practicers of the way. What's the way? The way is the way of Jesus, the lifestyle of Jesus. John Mark Comer puts it this way. If you want to experience the life of Jesus, then you have to adapt the lifestyle of Jesus. Another brilliant book. This one I would strongly recommend reading. The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Ooh, like just when the first time I heard that title, I thought that is 
going to be hard for me to read. <laughs> and it has been, but it's working on me so well. Maybe. Ilsa, it's working. All right. I'm a work in progress. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, invites us again to be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And I think I could say the same thing. Anything in me that is emulating Christ, copy that. If there's anything in my life, if there's anything in the people that are around us that emanates the love and the peace and the joy of Jesus, let's do that thing. I believe that Jesus had his life figured out. You never see him rushing. You never see him in a hurry. You never see him frantic. You never see him depressed. You never see him brushing somebody off for his own selfish purposes. But you do see somebody truly engaged with those around him. Having time, slow down, look people in the eye. It's not that Jesus didn't have stress. It's not that he didn't have worry. It's not that he never worried about or thought about his finances. I think that he preached, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear because those were real worries in his life. And that he found a way to step out of the worry and into faith or into something different. And if we can match and model his lifestyle through us, then we can start to emulate the life of Jesus in us. If you want to experience the life of Jesus, you have to adapt the lifestyle of Jesus. So it's goal oriented What have you set your eyes on lately? Who's your hero? What are the things that you've set your eyes on? And perhaps we can shift our eyes to the King of Kings who lived among us, who gave himself generously and lived a truly different and radically transformative life here on earth, not just to save us, but also so that we could emulate him and be more like him. Let's set our eyes on Jesus. Practice is goal oriented Practice is progressive, meaning that you're going to start off kind of bad at it. <laughs> and hopefully, as you practice, you get better at it. My kids just enrolled in Taekwondo, and my daughter came home and goes, that was hard. I loved it. I thought, man, I'm a good parent. <laughs> Right? We've taught her, like, challenge is good. The struggle is good. You start off bad at something, you're going to get better at it. These spiritual practices that we instill in our lives don't come naturally. If they did, I think we'd be a lot less stressed out naturally. So it's progressive. It's also effortful. It's not easy. And it's regular, meaning it's going to take a rhythm in our life, installing a new lifestyle for us to emulate the ways of Jesus. So once again, I ask, what are you practicing? What are you practicing? What are the rhythms in your life? What are you already doing? Because the life that you've achieved is, per, is perfectly designed around, or the, the, what you've achieved is perfectly around, designed around the life that you're leading. Jesus, I believe, does offer us and bring us into a new way of living. Jesus' practices are not like the world's practices. And I believe that the results of Jesus and the lifestyle of following Jesus is different than the results that we get when we follow the lifestyle of New York, the lifestyle of our culture. Once again, it's Atlas versus little baby Jesus. Every effort and every fiber of his being versus the divine power of our sovereign Lord. This is Jesus's invitation to a different practice coming from Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. But I wanna read it in the message version. I think it gets down a little bit deeper. Listen to this invitation that Jesus says to us. Are you tired? You worn out? Are you burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep my, com keep my company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Who wants that? <laughs> Who wants the unforced rhythms of grace? Who wants to see God working, not out of our struggle, but out of his word, it is finished? I want that. I need that. I want that peace of God that surpasses all understanding. What's that? The peace that just makes no sense to mount a garrison and build a wall around my heart and mind and defend me from everything that comes against me. That's the promise of Philippians 4 that we read together. Jesus, I need a new way. Lord, teach me a new practice. How do we do this together? 
Dallas Willard says this of spiritual disciplines, once again, just to whet our appetite for a different kind of practice, a different kind of living. The disciplines are activities of mind and body that, purpose, that are purposefully undertaken to bring, um, person, bring our personality and total being into the effective cooperation with the divine order. They enable us to live more and more in a power that is strictly speaking beyond us, deriving from the spiritual realm itself. We are facing our challenges day by day without the power that we were designed to live with. We're facing it like Atlas when we have Jesus in our corner. I want that Jesus that holds the world. Why would we face it day by day without Jesus in our corner, without the divine power working in us, without my personality and whole life starting to come into alignment with the divine order. We do this again through spiritual practices, worship, meditation, Sabbath rest, uh, reading the word of God, getting in church as you all are doing, regularly making a habit of fellowshipping and worshiping together. If you're online, there's an open invitation. We love you and we want to see you in the room where it happens, right here every Sunday. God is doing stuff here. So we're setting these rhythms in our life, but there's one other rhythm that I want to talk about this morning. And perhaps you're, you're hearing, I hear the, before I get to that though, I'm hearing the, the thing that just naturally bubbles up out of us when we start talking about doing more. I'm busy. You want me to do all that? What did you listen? Worship, meditation, Sabbath rest. I'm busy. I was at a birthday party this last week. I had a phenomenal little conversation with a seven-year-old boy who wants to be a pastor. And he's like, what's being a pastor like? And he's like, man, God asks us to love other people. How do we have that mindset? This is a real question a seven-year-old boy asked me. I turned to Philippians chapter one. It says, this mind is yours in Christ Jesus. And he goes, wow. And he goes, I love reading my Bible at night, but you know what? Sometimes I get too busy. <laughs> and I thought, man, I think this is a symptom of our humanity than our actual busyness. That there's other things that vie for the, ki the king's spot and the king's share in our life. Seven-year-olds feel too busy. 40-year-olds feel too busy, 60-year-olds, 80-year-olds, we all feel too busy. I've talked to people that are unemployed and say, Nathan, I'm too busy. I talk to people that work high-end corporate jobs and say, Nathan, I'm too busy. Busyness is just who we are. And maybe busyness is the symptom of our disease, not an excuse to pull back from the medication. Maybe busyness is the symptom that we need to fight to find the right time and the right share for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to enter into our busyness with us, which is what incarnation means, is to put on flesh and be with us. We celebrate him at Christmas because he's our Emmanuel, God with us, in the struggle with us, in the boat with us, sleeping in the boat with us. And we're like, God, we're stressed out. And he's like, I'm taking a nap. Maybe you should learn how to do the same. Somebody, somebody's like, yes, nap anointing, I, I received that. <laughs> Just one, though. Maybe busyness is the symptom. Maybe it's not an excuse. Maybe it's the symptom itself that we need to do some combat with to learn to create space in our life because hurry and rush means there's no space and no time for love. No space and no time for love. I was driving in this morning. My dad asked me to drop off his Bible with him, uh, which is on the way. And normally I'd drop it off with the doorman and run. But he says, hey, I'm coming down if you want to wait. And I thought, yes, I will wait. Because I wanted the blessing of seeing my dad. Amen. I wanted the blessing of just seeing him. And of course, he paused and prayed over the message because I was like, I want, and I, that's why, I, that's, I told him, that's the whole reason I stopped. It's the whole reason I waited. But if we rush, there's no time for love. If we rush, there's no time for blessing. And if we rush, there's no time for relationship. And there's no time for an exchange of, of encouragement if we rush. If we rush, we miss what our children are saying. We miss what our spouse is saying. We miss the opportunities that God is putting in front of us to encounter somebody and love somebody or receive grace from him if we're in a hurry. Maybe busyness is the symptom that we need to combat and not placate. So again, I ask, what are you practicing? 
What are you practicing? I want to look at the primary practice. There's a lot of practices that we've looked at. Pastor Shino looked at meditation last week, filling our minds and our hearts with memorized scripture and the word of God. We've looked at worship as we opened up this series, but there's one that I want to return to that we've also looked at. Shino mentioned this a couple weeks ago as well in prayer. The primary practice is prayer. Because prayer is both the ends and the means. Prayer is time with God. It's time in his presence. It's the place that we all want to go. We want to go to heaven. What's in heaven is God. 24-7, God. Just in his presence, God. Peace, love, joy, flowing, emanating from him. Not the other sources of dopamine that we get. Not the new bag, the new shoes, the new thing, the new this and that. The love from this person, the things that fade. But true, eternal happiness on tap, straight from the source, straight from the fountainhead, crystal clear. That's the image that we get in Revelation, being in the presence of God. That's the place that we want to go. And the means and the ends is prayer. It's the primary practice. And Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray in Matthew chapter 6. And it's something that we know, something that you've heard. It's called the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer because the Lord taught it and gave it to the disciples. And so with the disciples of Jesus with me today, stand up and let's read together, like we did earlier, the Lord or the Disciples' Prayer. Let's stand up and we're going we're gonna to take a moment to read this prayer and look at it, we're going to look at it a little bit more deeply in the time that we have left here today. Let's pray this together. Pray then like this. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. When I say prayer, you might, your head might go here. Your head might go to Jesus, I need X, Y, and Z. Amen. Your mind might go to some sort of grueling, agonizing thing where you get on your knees and just sweat for no reason for hours. I don't know where your head goes, but I want to unpack this prayer because prayer has a shape to it. And often our prayers, I believe, aren't answered because we're plain, flat prayers. Jesus, I need help on my rent. I've prayed that in the last month, right? Jesus, help! Flat. Why is there no authority on that? Why is there no understanding on that? Because I haven't climbed into prayer and prayed with authority back down into my situation. I want to show you the shape of prayer. It goes like this. There's, there's two halves to this prayer. There's earth or excuse me, there's heaven and then there's earth. And we start in heaven and we move toward earth. Our Father, our feet on the ground, looking up at our Father, our Father who's in heaven. I'm gonna worship, I'm gonna hallow you. There's so many things that are clamoring for my attention here, I'm gonna turn my attention to a new place. I'm gonna hallow you. Let your kingdom come as opposed to my kingdom or the kingdom that I serve here in New York. Let your will be done over my will. Now we turn with the authority of heaven and the revelation of heaven back down into the circumstances of earth. God, give me my provision, my daily bread today. Lord, now after I've honored you and I see that you are my source in all situations, God, thank you for providing my rent. There's a new authority, there's a new direction, there's a new power in our prayer when we've climbed up into heaven and pray with the authority, revelation, and power of heaven back down into our situations. Forgive us. Lord, I pray for grace for forgiving others. Thank you, Lord, I'm forgiving others, walking free of bitterness and resentment. And now, Lord, lead me. I'm ready to be led out of temptation and into your victory. Amen. When we pray in this way, when we pray from the revelation of earth that brings change, uh, excuse me, revelation of heaven which brings change onto earth, there's a lifestyle that starts to change who we are. And this lifestyle of prayer gives us the antidote to the diseases of our soul. I believe our soul is susceptible to certain things. Life in this world causes the diseases of soul to creep into us. And maybe you've experienced some of these. I know I have loneliness. Anonymity, not just people don't know me, I feel unseen, but also I don't know really who I am. Disillusionment, anxiety, guilt, resentment, fear. Look at how the Lord's prayer or the disciples' prayer starts to answer the diseases of our soul. 
to loneliness, our Father. We're praying together. There's a new people. There's a new power together. Our Father, not my Father, not your Father, not the Father, but our Father. John 1, 1 John 1 talks about if we walk in the light as He is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the love of Jesus is in us. The love of the Father is in us. We have a new community by walking in the light with God and with one another. There's fellowship. There's friendship. There's community. It's an answer to our loneliness. To the answer to our anonymity, feeling unseen, not knowing who we are, our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. When we, we are seen and we are known when we worship the one true Father. We move from anonymity into identity. I'm a son. I'm a daughter. I know who I am. Disillusionment comes from our hope and faith in this world. It's never going to answer us. But our hope is shifted from this decaying world onto the coming kingdom. And it's an answer to disillusionment, giving us faith and hope in every situation. Anxiety is met by, God, thank you that you're my provider. Give us this day our daily bread. Anxiety is met in this prayer and in this lifestyle of prayer. Guilt is broken because we receive forgiveness and um, absolution from all of our mistakes and shortcomings. Man, those things can creep up on us and want to drag us down. But we say, forgive us our debts. Resentment. Resentment is like drinking poison and hoping your enemy will die, is what Nelson Mandela says. But in prayer, we can release others. We forgive others as you've forgiven us. We release others and we don't drink that poison. And finally, we find victory over fear as we are led by the Lord into all of his victory. A lifestyle devoted to prayer is a life of deep in fellowship, identity, encouragement, and forgiveness. It's deep in victory. It's a brand new lifestyle. Yeah. And yet we find ourselves too busy. Jesus, help us. Give us the antidote to our soul. We're susceptible to these diseases. We need a new way to live. The results of this practice are transformative. Not just prayer, but just following Jesus. He's inviting us into this relationship where he enters in and fights our battles with us and for us. We move out of religion that says, do, 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 and into relationship where Jesus comes in and says, I've done it. You're good. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burdens are light. Listen, I'm gentle and lowly of heart. I'm not overbearing. I'm not some taskmaster. I'm not going to lay something that's ill-fitted or heavy upon you. I've made something just for you. Exit out of religion into relationship. I'm going to invite Aken up as we close out here today. Our goal and the, the goal of these practices, the result of these practices, is that the God of peace would be with us. Again, from Ephesians 4, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that makes no sense surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. When we practice these things, when we make room in our busy schedules for Jesus, he's gonna enter in. And that burden that your family, that your identity, that your father, that your mother, that your job, that this city has laid upon your shoulders is going to be taken off of you and you're going to receive a new yoke, one that's easy, one that's light, one that is full of the unforced rhythms of grace. We need a new relationship with Jesus. We need new space, a new time to enter in with him into this relationship, to learn from him, to receive from him, to practice these things. You stressed out? You burnt out? Are you snappy? Are you quick? Come to me. Are you tired? Are you depressed? Do you think you can't make it another day? Come to me. There's an open invitation 
to meet with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the one who holds the whole universe in his hands, the one who never gets stressed out, the one who never gets snappy, the one who is not angry at you, but is ready to help you. Jesus, we invite you into our hearts in a fresh way. We see, Lord, that we are susceptible to the diseases of this world. Our souls can be racked with these plagues. God, thank you that you're teaching us a new way. I believe that right now he's lovingly placing his finger on something in your heart, something in what you practice. He's just lovingly asking, shift, change. Thank you that today you're not laying upon us another burden, but you're taking our burdens off. So come, lay your burdens down. Lay those weights down, those expectations. I've got to be strong. I've got to be ruthless. I've got to be a winner. I've got to be a fighter. I've got to do it this way. Come meet the king who won every victory by laying his life down for us, who teaches us a new way to live, a new way to fight, a new way to win. Jesus, you're so good. We love you, God.